So today's workshop is about printing emergency admission and um, Zella, it is by Zella, Dr. Zella King from um, University um, College London. And the emphasis here is to how to implement the petition here in operational use. And our center is called Center of Marketing Analytic and Forecasting. Um, we basically provide many services, uh, bespoke short courses, consultancy, MSc summer projects, software development, PhD research. We also have some expertise in machine learning, uh, marketing analytics, demand forecasting, operational inventory management. So we have a lot of expertise. So if you are interested in working with us, just let us know. You can contact us um, via Twitter, LinkedIn, or email. We can have, we do have the, um, the website as well. So if you're interested, uh, just go for it. And then we have some ed educational videos about forecasting, demand planning, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's uploaded in our YouTube. And also we have our um, monthly Friday forecasting talk. So I will stop share my screen and I will let Zella to uh, present. Um, yeah, his, uh, her research. So over to you, Zella. Hey, Kandrika, yeah. thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, I'm Zella King. I work at the Clinical Operational Research Unit, which is part of UCL. Um, the work that I'm talking about has been done with a big team of others from UCL and from University College Hospital, um, including perhaps most important to the story I'm going to tell, Craig Wood, who is one of the senior operations managers, a bed manager, or as I'm going to refer to them, a flow coordinator at the hospital. And a lot of what I'm talking about is helping them forecast in a way which enables them to take short term actions. Um, so uh, the sort of run up to this piece of work was um, a proof of concept. That's how it all began. Um, and we were able to publish the results of the proof of concept in Nature Digital Medicine. Um, and that came out nearly two years ago. But in the intervening two years, we've made the difference between having something that was an interesting proof of concept and a piece of research into having something which is used routinely by the hospital to inform their bed management. Um, so that's just the story I really want to tell is how we moved on from the original work to something which is truly usable in practice. So I'll talk about the original application, um, what motivated it and how it changed. And then sort of telling the story of how we really engaged with Craig and his team, our stakeholders, in order to understand what they really needed from an information product to inform their operational practice. I'll, I suspect most interesting to this group will be then talking about the problem fra framing and how we formulated it, um, the, ma the mathematics and the data, um, and then how, how we've developed and, and deployed it so that it's now implemented. Um, so that was the, the paper I mentioned um, that came out in 2022, and I should also mention the funders. The initial work was funded by UCL, uh, a sort of welcome strategic support grant um, led by Professor Sonia Crow, who's with me at the Clinical Operational Research Unit. Um, and then later on, it moved to uh, be sort of under the auspices of another project led by Steve Harris um, that was funded by the NAIHR. And actually that transition is part of the story I'm gonna tell as well in terms of how we, we got this into implementation. Um, so the motivation will be to nobody's surprise that hospitals um, are at capacity and that causes major delays in emergency departments as people wait for beds. So if you're a bed manager, um, your job is, yes, to allocate patients to available beds, but you're also monitoring hospital capacity because if it if you get too full such that you can't provide safe care to new incoming patients, then you need to escalate and take action. And so they're always engaging in short term anticipatory planning of the bed state. Um, also, to no, no one's surprise, I mean, flows out of the emergency departments are very are complicated. So you don't know what your emergency demand is going to be at any point in time. Um, there are patterns, but you don't. You, there's, there's this very inherent variability, and that stream of demand competes with elective demand that you do know about. Um, although even electives are uncertain, in the sense that 
pe some people may or may not need beds after a procedure, and that's never known until the day. So there's intrinsic uncertainty in all pathways and also on wh when people are going to actually get out of the hospital. So blocks on discharges are a well-known problem. In the operational research literature, um, there, I mean, I think it, OR scholars are probably drawn to this kind of problem because it is interconnected and there's lots of sort of complexity, but almost by necessity, while presenting an interesting problem to model, OR scholars have to make simplifications in order to make it tractable to analysis. Um, so you've got that on the one side in the literature. On the other side, you've also got lots of the machine learning health informatics literature, which is very immersed in the data and the potential for machine learning and so on to kind of really give you know, better, make better use of the data that's available in hospital systems. Um, so lots of activity interest on that side as well, not just on clinical applications of machine learning, but also as is relevant here in operational ap applications. But if you look at the hospital's response to how they're actually dealing with the short term anticip anticipatory sort of planning problems, they're not really deploying much of either of these two sort of things that scholars might think they were doing. So this is how our hospital currently forecasts emergency demand. So they have this spreadsheet which is circulated widely in it on a ward by ward basis. They look at capacity in terms of the number of beds, how many are assigned to patients, how many have known patients coming in. And then to balance that supply side picture, they look at the demand and they calculate yesterday's total, total emergency admissions and they subtract from that the number of people that they've admitted so far today. And that gives them a picture up until midnight tonight. So on this particular day, uh, they were anticipating that they still needed to to admit 40 because they had 59 yesterday and they've admitted uh, 19 today so far. And they are predicting a net positive position at midnight of five patients. So uh, tight, but but five beds is 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 acceptable. Um, and then this spreadsheet gets prepared five times a day and it gets circulated around the hospital to all sorts of people, everyone from the chief executive um, through heads of operations, chief nurses, matrons, ward sisters, facilities people, and externally. Um, and then in addition to circulating this spreadsheet, they also have three, what they call flow huddles at 9.30 midday and, and 3.30, where they're reviewing who's in the emergency department. And they're also looking at pl planned and query discharges in order to to reach a secure position about what the bed state is going to be. And, and those meetings have other purposes as well. So they're also about solving um, blocks where people are waiting for things if they can be solved. So what what this looks like is hospitals are not using the sophisticated sort of tools that are reported in the literature. They're using, they're favoring kind of a detailed grounded view um, of really what's happening on the ground today over models that might identify optimal actions. And so our logic is that this presents an opportunity to augment the information available to them and therefore the processes that they're managing using a combination of operational research and predictive analytics. And so our contribution really is to give an account of how we developed and implemented sorry, into routine use a prediction tool. Um, and in terms of like the, the sort of three areas I want to cover, I'm going to talk about how we engaged and immersed with Craig and his colleagues to understand their world, um, the predict analytics elements of it, and then the implementation. So starting with the engagement part, um, this is a long standing relationship which began in 2019 when uh, my colleague Sonia Crow uh, bid for some work and has has developed and evolved into a very close relationship where we've I'm now embedded as part of the bed management team at UCLH. The first version of the product that we developed for them was launched in sort of autumn of 2021, and that's the one written up in our paper. Um, much of this talk is about the transition from version one to version two and what's happened since version two was launched. Um, I think it's interesting to think about the research setting here. So in the wider context, and this uh, paper I cited here is done with some of the colleagues on this project, um, 
sorry, it's not my paper. They have done the, this uh, writing about the, the, the clinical de deployment environment that our tools are, are implemented in. But that one of their arguments is that um, very few machine learning models, despite the promise, very few of the machine learning models that have reached the bedside actually use electronic health record data. They're generally using data from isolated systems and a common example is radiology, but you're not using the flow of real time sort of 24 hour picture of patients um, from the electronic health record. So they're promoting the use of tip of real world data, so called um, for research, but may also making the point that usually when you're using real world data for either for research or for kind of service improvement like our project it's in a an environment where the data is taken out of its real time place so it's a data to modeler environment so a typical pattern is the hospital data will be put in a trusted research environment isolated from its real use immediate use and the modeler accesses it there so in, they are promoting the other way around which is that the modeler gets immersed in the data, which by necessity means that it's patient identifying. And one of the points there is that if you're going to do something for a clinical tool or, or an operational tool in practice in real time, it's going to need to be patient identifying because it's not much use if it isn't. Um, so that's the background of this hospital that we're working in. So they have a, a vision and a commitment to predictive modeling. They have an electronic health record called EPIC. And they have an architecture upon which they can do real time inference called EMAP. And they have remote desktops whereby the modelers can get to the data. Plus um, application environments where you can actually deploy um, tools that you've built. So these are not things that every hospital would have. And it's important to uh, acknowledge that this is a precursor to much of what we've been able to do. If you now look at the electronic health record uh, and the and the view of the world from the bed manager's point of view, um, I've sort of depicted it here. You've obviously you don't know anything about the general public, obviously, but you do know about the patients. If you were to look at the electronic health record, you would know about the patients in the A&E, and you know about the inpatients. And then within the A&E, you'd know where they are located, whether in majors. Uh, with more acute problems, whether they're in the minors stream or whether they're in same day emergency care, which is meant to be for ambulatory, ambulatory care, but people do also get admitted from there. Um, so once a decision is made to admit a patient, then a bed manager is trying to sort of triage them into beds uh, according to their specialty, medical, surgical, hematology, oncology, in our case, or paediatric. So that this is the kind of view that they can see as a bed manager. You only really know about your incoming demand substantively once a decision to admit has been made. In our proof of concept, we were able to build on this view for them because we were able to give them, the, there are three contributions really to that work. So the first thing we did was we used machine learning to predict each patient's probability of, of admission. So that's why I've color coded the people in the emergency department um in various levels of intensity based on their probability of admission that was done with the machine learning model uh, we also did then applying some of the techniques of operational research presented an aggregate um picture over the number of beds needed because if you're a bed manager you're more relevant to you is the number of beds that you need to plan for rather than or as much as whether any individual patient is going to be admitted so a lot of machine learning Scholars have developed models that take patients uh, in A&E and generate a probability for each patient. But the utility comes when you can generate a probability over a number of beds. And I'll talk more about how we do that here. Um, and then the other thing we did was we also incorporated the patients yet to arrive. Because although you don't know specifically from your health record about the patients yet to arrive, you do have patterns of of demand and as as people interested in forecasting you will appreciate um, lots of forecasting work has been done on a and e arrivals so using things like you know the season the time of day whether it's a weekend school holidays traffic problems and all of those kind of things uh, can be used to predict how many people show up at the front door but then equally we can use same kind of techniques to predict how many of those who show up at the front door in a horizon to come will need a bed 
so when you're looking over, say, a window of time between now and midnight, you will expect some number of patients currently in your a &E to be admitted. And then you'll also expect some number of people who haven't arrived yet um, to be admitted between now and then. So after the proof of concept, we had uh, some output that looked like this, and we've got a, a sort of um, probability distribution approach where we said in the emergency department, you know, this is your probability of needing, say, at least 10 beds or 12 beds. And then we did the same for the patients in the same day emergency care area. Um, and we were able to, uh, as a result, after the proof of concept, we could email this out to them four times a day to coincide with their kind of own predictions. But we, in the time, even at the time, we were aware that this didn't really go far enough because so long as you present this as your demand, as your incoming demand, and we were doing it over an eight hour time horizon. Uh, actually, apologies, no, we weren't. We were just saying of the patients in ED now, we think you're gonna need this number of beds. So we weren't at that stage um, introducing a sort of eight hour time horizon to it. But, um, whilst you present this kind of picture um it's still a hospital-wide problem because there's no obvious action for any particular specialty to take if you're just giving them an overall picture whereas if you can say there's going to be a demand for medical beds or there's a demand for surgical beds for females in the next eight hours then you've got something that's a bit more actionable because you can start putting pressure on the surgical wards to see if they can discharge anyone sooner so we needed to predict forthcoming demand by specialty. We also needed to distinguish between the patients the bed managers already knew about because they had bed requests from the ones that they didn't know about. Um, and also we wanted to acknowledge the four hour targets for A&E because um, ideally, if someone arrives in the next five minutes, they, have a, they should have a high probability of being admitted within the next eight hours because most um, A&Es are still aiming for a, to see everyone um, 70, I think it's the current target it used to be 95%. They now have to see 76% of patients either admit them or discharge them within four hours if they are to meet their targets. So we also want to acknowledge that kind of aspirational view, even though, in fact, a &E performance has been very, very poor and declining over the last few years. So we've now completed the, the work and this is what the new output looks like. So it is a spreadsheet. Um, not as funky as, an, as the nice colour coded thing that I showed you before, but we send them a, a spreadsheet five times a day. We distinguish between the patients they know about who have a decision to admit on the left, columns B and C. Columns D and E have a, a probability distribution, a prediction over the patients currently on the ED. And then the final columns F and G have a prediction over the patients yet to arrive. Um, and so, and you can see we break it down into the specialty areas that they use, medicine, surg surgery, hematology, oncology, and pediatric. Um, and then we're getting, it's less of a prob probability distribution, but there is still some element here of showing a numbers with a probability associated with them. So this, in column D, we're saying at this point in time, there's a 90% probability that you'll need two medical beds for the patients in ED now. And there's a 70% probability you'll, you'll actually need three. So it's trying to give some sense of the, the uncertainty around the predictions rather than giving a single estimate on the basis that will be familiar to you. I'm sure that you actually have more information when you know the range of uncertainty that, than you do when you have a single point estimate. So that's, that gives you a, a, an, a sense of um, what we learned through our process of engagement and immersion with, with stakeholders. So we understood what would constitute a useful information product to them. And we had some sense of what capabilities the hospital information systems, including EPIC, um, had that would en enable us to do this. Uh, turning now to the sort of how the modeling was done. So I've sort of alluded already to the fact that we're making a prediction at a point in time, and we're interested in a point hence where in this case, the gap between the two is eight hours. So I've got here a T1, which is our moment of prediction, and T2 is sometime in the future um, in terms of our formulation. And then we also know that we're interested in prediction by specialty. So the modelling has two elements, a number of missions of patients who are ready in the ED to each clinical area before time T2. And then we also need to allow for the people who have yet to arrive who will be admitted to each clinical area before T2. 
So it's taking the first one first. Um, we have a probability of any given patient in the ED now being admitted and then their probability of admitted um, being admitted to a specialty. And uh, the product of those two gives us their probability of being admitted, if they're admitted, being admitted to a specialty. Um, and then we can use a generating function uh, from those probabilities to give us a number of beds required in each specialty by the I patients, capital I patients currently in the ED. So we get that random variable um, on in equation two. So I'll talk about how we derive PI, the probability of a patient being admitted, and then QIC, which is a probability that if they're admitted, they are admitted to a given specialty C. Um, so we estimate PI using machine learning. Here I'm showing um, a, at a point in time, the patients who are in the a &E at that moment, and each patient is represented by a circle. Um, down the left-hand side, you've got the various locations um, where they were at that time. Without going into the detail of those, um, the two areas of interest are resus and majors, where you have large circles. Those are the two bits of the ED which typically have the most acute patients. The size of the circle represents their probability of admission, uh, according to the model. Um, and so, as you might expect, the, the ones in resus and majors are, are being given higher probability. This figure excludes patients already known to the bed managers. So this is interesting because you're looking here as a bed manager, you might be thinking of, of excluding the patients I already know about. I can see at least three here who've got a very high probability of admission, one in resus and two in majors. Um, so therefore, this is giving me some anticipation of the forthcoming demand beyond the clouds, if you like, that I can't directly see from, from my current list of bed requests. Um, in terms of the technical detail, we had about 200,000 visits. Um, we had um, a sort of chronological split between the training set, the validation set and the test set. Uh, that's in order to try and avoid um, trying to observe problems of model drift if chain practice on the ground changes between your training set and your test set you will be able to observe this by the de deterioration of performance of the models i have more lots more detail about the machine learning aspects that people are interested um, in sort of additional slides but i'll go through this relatively quickly um, in terms of the performance of the model uh, so we have a reasonable um, AUC of 0.9. Uh, it's it's well calibrated, as you can see in the middle chart. Um, the in terms of which, because this is XG boost, you do get some ability to interpret the model, and we can see that it's using um, as the most important features the elapsed time the patient's been in the department, their admission admission age, the heart rate, um, white cell count, uh, various other lab results. Um, there's some also some capture of kind of um, staff behavior, like how many lab orders have been made, how many consultation requests to colleagues uh, for an inpatient review have been made, et cetera. So again, I could talk more about the details of the machine learning uh, finding if that's useful. Um, one thing I will say is that being able to do an interpretable machine learning uh, output like this is very helpful for communicating to stakeholders both the bed managers, but also people in the a and &E clinicians about what signals the model's actually picking up on. Um, so we didn't use a you know, sophisticated artificial neural network um, and we didn't need to because actually we've got very good performance here, plus the benefit of having interpretable results. Then the next probability to estimate is the probability if someone is admitted, they're, they're probably going to, to any given specialty. And here we have data on consults which are issued while you're in A&E. Um, if you're likely to be admitted, then the staff there will issue a consult request for someone in one of the wards to come down and review you. So if you're likely to be a medical patient, you're gonna get a medical type of review. So here I've color coded the consult requests as um, according to the type of consult uh, request made, mm -hmm. and they're, they're in little circles. And then the squares show you which special to the were ultimately admitted to. I've excluded paediatric patients here because they are, as a matter of sort of protocol, they're always admitted to uh, paediatric wards. 
So we're only really interested in this problem for adults. So we use a patient age to, to, to generate the probative paediatric admissions. And then we use consults for everyone else. And you can see here that most people only have one and they match pretty well. So if you have a medical type consult, then you probably end up in a medical ward. Um, but there are some who have more than one, like the two at the bottom. Um, and you can see the very bottom patient um, had some consult requests in the middle of the night, two, three, four in the morning. The first one was surgical. Then they had two medical consult requests, which were probably not acted upon possibly until later in the day, which is why they then spent a very long time waiting. <laughs> but they were finally admitted or it may have been that there was no bed for them. That's also quite a likely um, scenario. They were finally admitted about 6 p.m. to a medical ward. So we can use these consult requests to, to generate a probability. And we, and we think of them as a kind of um, sequence um, as if they were if you as if you had a decision tree. So at any point in time, you've gone down a branch, which is that you've had a medical consult or a surgical consult. You might end up there or you might go on further down a branch to have a further consult type. So we can see it as a kind of branching tree where the terminal nodes are, are the sequence of consult requests that you end up with. And at any branching node, you've got some probability of either staying at that node or going further down towards um, uh, another another branching node. Um, then we can associate each terminal node with its probability of being admitted to each um, specialty. So we use the product of the the fact that if you're at a branching node, then you have a certain probability of ending up at each terminal node, and then at your terminal node, you have a probability of ending up in each specialty. So we use the product of those two to get our probability of being admitted to a specialty. So that uh, gives a sense of the first part of the modelling. The second part of the modelling is thinking about um, patients who haven't arrived yet, who should um, arrive and be admitted within the, our time window of interest. So here uh, we, we're formulating it as a time varying process and distribution for arrivals at time t. Um, and then we can use a probability of anyone arriving at a time t being admitted to a specialty by the end point of our window. Um, we can represent that as a probability and then use a, a generating function to estimate the number of beds needed for that moment of time. And I should say here that we're using the way we're thinking about this is to divide the time between T1 and T2 into a series of discrete time intervals, because that makes the maths easier if we consider them as discrete time intervals rather than continuous time. It means we don't have to do complicated integration. Instead, we can take the product over all, all of the discrete time intervals between T1, our point of prediction, and, and T2. Um, and then we, from that, we can get a generating function for the, for the random variable of all of the likely emissions after T1 before T2. So the interesting thing about this um, equation is how do we come up with the probability of an arrival at any time in time point T being admitted by the end of our time window. So this is a point where if we were to learn from historical data, then we would possibly understate demand because hospitals have been forming worse and worse over the last sort of 12 years, sad, I mean, really sadly. Um, there was a 95% target set, um, I guess, in the 2010s um, that most a &Es were were achieving. So they were seeing 95% of people within four hours. Um, but that performance has gradually declined over the years since then. And if we were to take the period of our training set and simply do a time varying process and say, OK, at any point in time, um, say midday today, how many patients would arrive after midday and be admitted before 8 p.m. tonight? The answer would probably be very, very few because um, they're just, for various reasons, mainly to do with bed capacity. Most people have to wait a long time in a &E before they get admitted. So therefore, we wouldn't predict, we wouldn't, uh, our, our patterns of past arrivals and admissions would suggest that no one actually gets admitted within eight hours. And that's that would understate the true demand because the, the true situation is people have arrived and they have decisions to admit, but they just haven't got a bed yet. So they're still waiting 
in A and E. So therefore, we needed a different way to try and model this problem to get this this probability out. And the way we did it instead was to look at a year when the A and E was still performing according to these ninety five percent targets, um, and then extrapolate from that. So this chart shows your in, in sort of increments between your arrival moment and four hours. What's your if for, for admitted patients in blue and then from discharge patients in orange, what was your probability of leaving in any of those intervals? And you can see that the patients who are discharged are sort of generally discharged at a linear with a linear probability between zero minutes and, and four hours, whereas all the admitted patients tend to get admitted in the last kind of 30 minutes before the four hour target. So we use those probabilities to uh, to estimate our probability of someone being admitted given the time point of prediction up to time at the end point of our prediction window. Um, so that that gives us the second element of our, of our modeling. And I should also say perhaps in with reference to this part, this uh, second part, we're not really able to evaluate the predictive models because they are aspirational. So there is no ground truth against which to compare so there is no sort of evaluation component to this. This is an aspirational view of how many you would admit if you were performing to, according to targets. And finally, some words about the implementation. Um, so the um, first version of this was written as a standalone kind of R script. So in the programming language R um, and as I said, it was a proof of concept, so it had no real sort of information governance around it. Um, when I and the work moved on to the second project that I mentioned, a project called Highload, um, that project was trying to be something a bit different. So the, the Highload project was trying to build a proof of concept machine learning operations platform to demonstrate the idea of bringing modelers to data in a research environment. And so it had a lot more of the kind of discipline and structure that you'd find in industry, um, if machine learning operations in industry, including sort of the, the concept of the feature store, which is a kind of pre-curated set of features that a modeler could have access to. And then the concept of kind of governance where you're ensuring um, that there's lots of privacy. Uh, so you're sort of pseudonymizing any patient or information so that research can never see it. You're controlling carefully at who has access to the data, these kind of things. Um, so when this work sort of moved on and became adopted by the Highload project, there was a lot of work involved in doing adaptations. Um, without going into too much of the detail, a complete rewrite, rewrite in a new language in Python rather than R, different kind of way of conceiving the structure of programs in, in object-oriented pr programming in, in Python. Um, lots of rewriting, um, more structure around uh, an application called MLflow to manage sort of model experiments, um, common shared libraries between common between development and, and deployment environments. So lots more complexity as a as a researcher slash modeler working with data. There were suddenly lots of intervening layers which I now needed to navigate. Not least because. The Hilo platform was not designed for ED data, it was designed for intensive care data. Um, and much of that code had to be completely rewritten to, to be suitable for the kind of temporal framing and the data sparsity of emergency demand patients. They're very different from ICU patients where you have time series of data streaming routinely from lots of different devices. So, um, so whilst this is um, it was very frustrating and added a lot of complexity. It was also important in terms of rolling with the tide, if you like, of the hospital and where it was going or how it was thinking about informatics, because this was the best way at the time to get the product into implementation. And having refused, if I had refused to rewrite it in Python, it may not have been implemented. Uh, this, I put this diagram in not because I propose to explain it, because I certainly don't, but just to show the kind of complexity of the environment. And it has been written about by my colleagues 
um, if anyone does happen to be interested, just really to make the point here that EMAP is the database which has the relevant data in, the real-time data. The users are on the far right of the diagram and just to illustrate the number of kind of different architecture steps involved in getting the data from its source um, in front of the users um, for, to whom it's useful. We, we were able to achieve this and the high load platform serves up the spreadsheet that I showed you earlier and it's a spreadsheet so it's not a very sexy uh, output from a piece of health informatics work um, but I you know we consider it to be a successful implementation of operational research and, and data analytics because they they're involved in the development of it they use it and they talk about it so for UCLH, this is something they're proud to share with other hospitals and with NHS England. And the predictions themselves get copied into that spreadsheet that I showed you at the beginning, and then they show up on, on one of the cover sheets, um, incorporated now into the bed manager's own spreadsheet. So this is like sort of death by a series of spreadsheet <laughs> steps in the sense that yes, the predictions are being, being now incorporated into the daily practice of the web managers, and that is not to be underestimated, um, but still in a, in a relatively unsophisticated form. And I'll say more about that in, in a moment. Um, I think, but it's also important to understand all of the other efforts that we've gone to, to promote and secure um, adoption by the trust. So in addition to pragmatically rebuilding the application on the high load platform, um, the rewriting in Python that I was talking about. Um, there have been lots of different things that helped to deepen the relationship with the bed manager team. Um, regular attendance at those flow huddles that I talked about, they have three times a day. We've worked together on, paper, on um, submission of papers and this a version of this talk um, is available on, was I should say 2023, not 2003, um, on the right hand side there. That QR code takes you to a version of this talk on, on YouTube. Um, but that was you know, a, a joint effort by me and Craig Wood. So helping the bed manager team to feel part of this. Um, I've also been involved with writing nominations of the Trust for Digital Awards. Um, and then also not to be underestimated, I and one other person um, continue to support the application on a pro bono Basis. So just this week, someone changed a table in the EMAP database, which meant the application fell over because no one had changed it. So John, my colleague, figured out where the problem was, fixed it, restarted the application. But these are the kind of things that make it really hard for the output of research to end up in, in real practice. And thankfully, John is still around to do those kind of things, and so am I. Um, and then alongside working within the flow coordination team, um, various presentations to UCLH committees, um, and then I've written a paper making the case that the trust should now fund and support this application and the knowledge of how to maintain it should become internal. And they've they've now agreed to this uh, to fund the app, to fund that idea, although we haven't seen the money yet. Um, and then. Other, other external meetings with them and on their behalf as a, as a trust, like um, just last week talking to NHS England, operational people in the urgent, urgent and emergency care stream. So talking about what UCLH is able to do with its electronic health record that not many other trusts can do yet, but trying to create a vision for what could happen in the future. Uh, so in terms of the next steps, um, so we're now you know, I am still around because we've got some more funding and now we're looking at sort of further downstream patient flow. We're looking at discharge predictions in a similar way to, to admissions. So when we can really tackle predicting who's going to leave a bed, then we can maybe help move on from that spreadsheet, which is their current best guess at uh, their hospital state. Um, and hopefully, you know, they give them perhaps a, a more sophisticated tool of bed state. That would be the ultimate um, goal, I think. Uh, and then we've also got some funding to disseminate the work uh, on the admission side. So I'm in the process of creating a GitHub repository, showing how the modeling was done, 
hopefully with a data set that we can share. Um, I will be doing some webinars to talk to specifically to NHS analysts about the modelling and how you might do it in your own trust if with your own EHR data. And we've got some funding to visit six hospitals to share that. So if you happen to know a hospital that might be interested, then please do let me know because I'd be very keen to make links there. Uh, thank you very much for your time um, and very happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Zella, for a very interesting talk. Um, I do have a question, basically. Um, do you see a, do do we see any improvement after this implementation in terms of uh, the, the the waiting time and also cool. uh, the kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, that is the the ultimate question, isn't it? Um, so the answer is, well, uh, waiting times vary, um, and even if there was an improvement, there would be so many factors contributing to that, that it would be really impossible to isolate the improvement to this tool in and of itself. Um, over the winter, hospitals are notoriously very busy, and that is definitely the case this year. So in some ways, being able to predict demand for beds is, is um, a moot point because there's not much that can be done to free up capacity until people leave. Um, I think one of the most important improvements that has resulted from this is, is a more sophisticated understanding by the hospital of what they need to in order to um, be able to really ha have a better short term picture of their bed state position. Because we're only talking about elective demand here, but if we could incorporate with in this, sorry, we're only talking about emergency demand. If we could incorporate elective and other incoming sources of demand, and we could incorporate discharges, as I said, then you you've really got something. But I think they they they're, they're on a journey with this, and so I think the best outcome is their own sort of sophistication about how they think and anticipate how they think about short term pressure on beds and how they respond to that. Okay, so we have a question from Kyle Karen. Do trusts contact you if they are interested in being involved? What is the requirement yeah. of trust to participate? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karen. I do. I have a, like a one page document that I could send um, to, to give a trust a sense. It, it's not a big commitment because really it's just about whetting the appetite. So the idea would be one or two interested analysts um, or an interested operations manager. And I would do quite slightly different things for each because if it was your operations manager, I would want to talk about how the bed management team at UCH have benefited from this. If it's the analysts, it'd be more like, this is what you could do with your data if your operations people were interested. So can Drika, what's the best way to share that one page? Maybe I could send it to you and you could send it on to Karen or? Sure, yeah. 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 That's brilliant. Um, maybe uh, Kyle, Karen, um, Kyle, yeah, maybe you can get in touch with us uh, via LinkedIn so we can send it to you. Yeah. So there's a question from Ivan, um, yeah. our member. So I support the idea of using XGBoost, but have you tried other approaches to make sure that it is the best choice? Yeah. yeah. So we, in that uh, Nature Digital Medicine paper, we had the same question from a reviewer. Um, and so we tried random forest and we also tried, tried a penalized logistic regression. Um, and we, there, there is a figure actually in that paper where we show that XGBoost is only marginally better than the logistic regression and the logistic regression is marginally better than random forest. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Obviously, someone else has the same idea as you, Ivan, if not, if, even if you were the reviewer. But I think it's, um, there, were, there were some very valid points coming back from that review, which included, well, what if a hospital had less data than you have? Because we had, we had quite a sophisticated range of features. Um, so that was something that we also were able to do using the penalised logistic regression approach. Um, we could enforce reducing the number of um, variables used and could see how performance deteriorated with fewer variables, just as a as a proxy for imagining that a different trust might have fewer 
data points available. So we're able to show that you could still get somewhat usable performance using a few variables as well. Is there any reason why you end up with um, XGBoost? Because you say that it is marginally better than the actual uh, data Um, I think we, we selected it pragmatically because it runs fast and it's interpretable mm. and you don't have, you, it can handle missing data. Um, whereas with logistic regression, you have to kind of um, impute missing values. So there are a few reasons why it made it a good choice. Um, and so it was nice that when we compared it with other things, they did. Yeah. but we didn't we didn't try an artificial neural network to be honest um i think the simpler model is the better model so mm. what why overcomplicate things with a neural network where you don't know what you're what it's using if you can stick with something mm. that is interpretable that was our view yeah okay okay so there's also a question from ivan um i did not fully understand how you did that to capture uncertainty around the final recommendation. I didn't understand how you did that. Was there a specific method that you used for that? Yes. So I think what I meant by that was that if we're saying there's a probability that you're going to need two medical beds in the next eight hours, uh, rather than just giving the number two, we wanted to give some sense of the uncertainty around that. So the way you would do that in an academic context is you'd give a probability distribution but for our, and so that's what that's in effect what we did a bit like the the first version of the output that I showed. Um, but for our users, they're not sophisticated sort of maths people. Probability isn't necessarily something we're familiar with. So it was a kind of giving them a, a sort of this is we've got a ninety percent probability of needing at least number of, this number of beds. So that's your kind of minimum number you should be planning for. And then there's actually a seventy percent probability you're going to need more beds than that, so plan for that. We're just starting to give them a sense of what we think of as operational researchers when we're trying to sort of model things probabilistically. Uh, does that answer the question, Ivan? Okay, he said yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, is there any more questions? Yes, yeah, so I think um, we have covered all of the questions that from the uh, audience. It was interesting talk, Zella, um, because we are usually, again, same, um, we we usually build a model, but we don't really implement it. So your experience yeah. in implementation here is very, very, for me at least, it's very important Then at, we, we have some picture how we really we do it and how connect with the trust, how we build the trust to the, the client or the users of the of, of our prediction. Uh, yes. I appreciate it's not always easy, but my my encouragement would be any time you have the chance to shadow someone or interview them about how they would use your forecasts or in any way kind of get slightly immersed in what they do, I highly recommend it. Um, mm -hmm. But apart from this, it starts building a relationship which may lead somewhere. Um, yeah. But then it also will inform your both your modeling and how you write up the model. Um, so that that's I feel very fortunate to have been in a position where I've been able to build up this relationship over a long period of time. I know that's not always possible as a you know as a postdoc where you can only be on a project for as long as you have funding to be on that project. So I've been really fortunate with that. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah it's a privilege. Okay, okay. Thank you for right. thank you, uh, Zela, and um, thank you for uh, attend attendee. So maybe see you next uh, webinar next month. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks you. for organizing, Katrika. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.